I guess while we wait, are there any questions from last time? Okay. One, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working in conventions where two is equal to one. Also. The one with the hat? No, we were uh, the one with the hat. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. she was she was with Andy. With Andy, okay. Yeah, on his BMS stuff. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. she was like, oh, something else. What? Like, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I told her about it. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 So I'll uh, continue the discussion we were having last time. So last time we uh, we noticed that we could uh, take the SYK model and up to this uh, replica corrections, which go like one over n to the q, we could replace it by an integral, functional integral, over uh, some variables sigma tilde and g tilde, and then some action which uh, had a fact an overall factor of n. And then was some factor of sigma tilde and g tilde, right? Um, so this is uh, this gives the partition function, and if we wanted to calculate something like a four-point function, so for example, a four-point function of the form psi i of t1, psi i of t2, psi j of t3, psi j of t4, and for the sake of the argument, let's imagine we are summing over the indices i here, and also over the indices j. Um, that integral is uh, will be given by... Um, so here we don't have the fermions explicitly, uh, but we can compute things like this that have the sum over indices by replacing... Um, re remember that one of the equations of motion was set in this equal... Well, there was a delta function in the functional integral that was setting... Um, this quantity to g tilde, okay? And then we remember the change of variables, so it, we started from uh, the functional integral for the fermions, and then we introduced the variable g tilde, which was equal to um, to this this quantity, and that equality was enforced by the integral over sigma, right? And then we had some action, then we could integrate the fermions, and we had some effective action in terms of sigma tilde and g tilde. So that means that we can in do this integral by uh, doing the functional integral, the same functional integral we have here. Um, and now here we put just g tilde of points 1 and 2, and g tilde points 3 and 4. Right? These are uh, the two arguments, the two times that are the arguments of the g's. Uh, and then we have, uh, well, the action, uh, well, minus the action of uh, sigma tilde and g tilde. And in principle, uh, the leading order computation here is given by putting the classical values here uh, the, for the classical solution, and that just gives us the disconnected answer, right? The disconnected, uh, that gives us a product. So this is the leading order answer, is g of uh, 1 and 2. g of 1 and 2 are the, is the classical solution, and then 3 and 4. And then if we want to calculate corrections, we have to do the functional integral for fluctuations around 
this uh, the original solution. So we take uh, so we have the action s. Let, let me call it x zero of g and sigma. This is the action on the classical solution, and then uh, we expand this to quadratic order um, in g and sigma and so on. And then we have some fluctuations of g and sigma, uh, both g and sigma um, of this type. And then we need to integrate them out, and in that way we generate the correction. And because there is an n here, once we do that integration, we'll get a 1 over n. So the answer here will have a 1 over n. And then there will be here some function of the four times that we get by somehow inverting this operator. And that, in principle, uh, can be done. Um, however, uh, there is a, a, a low energy. So this can be done, and can be done for any value of uh, beta and j, so for any value of the the temperature. Um, but now we are going to start discussing some aspects when beta j is much bigger than 1. And in this regime, uh, we have seen that the, uh, this action has some zero modes, almost zero modes. right? So in the space of g's and sigmas, uh, we have, so these are the g's and the sigmas. And we'll have some manifold. Uh, of uh, low energy, low action solutions, um, and so we can, because those, uh, yeah, and we can parameterize the action along uh, this line, um, so the full action um, only along this uh, valley. Uh, we can parameterize this as a, as a function of f, which is f is a coordinate uh, that takes us uh, it's a separate parameterization, but it moves us along this valley. Okay. Um, and we have this action, which, uh, well, n times f was n times alpha over j of uh, the Schwarzian derivative of f uh, tau. Okay, so we have this action, and so this action, uh, this is just so we, there was the classical solution, and this is just the action along this uh, valley. It's, uh, and for large j, this is a smaller. Uh, this action is smaller than. Uh, the values of the action in these directions. So when we integrate things out, so when we integrate this f out, uh, we'll get an answer here that will be enhanced relative to the other terms. So the integration along these directions will give us uh, here some functions of the times which are of order 1, right? Um, and then the, in and the integration of this piece will give us a bigger factor that will be enhanced by a factor of, uh, of j. Okay? So it's this j, and then by dimensional analysis, we'll have, let's say, a factor of beta, and then we'll have here some function of the ti's over beta. Okay? So um, the, the pieces, so this piece will be uh, essentially independent of, uh, of j, right? So there will be a function of the times divided by beta, uh, dimensionless function of this kind, and it can be computed using techniques of conformal symmetry and so on. Um, and then this uh, piece um, is bigger and is given by doing the functional integral only over along this valley. Okay, so that functional integral is uh, given by so we we have to change the measure first to integrate along the orthogonal directions and then along this direction. So there is some measure for integration for f, and then uh, here we put the gf one two. Remember gf is just the a reparameterization acting on the classical solution. So we had the classical solution, which was a simple scaling law, and then we have this reparameterization acting on it. And in this, um, so this is a function of f, and then we have a similar uh, thing, a fu function of f, and then we have this action, so e to the minus n over j. Um, there are some coefficients here I'm not writing, uh, the Schwarzian derivative. And if we put the signs right, uh, the, there is a plus here, so that's uh, the uh, that that's what we would like to compute, um, and we can we can do we can do this, um, and we um, if we are doing it in the context of perturbation theory, so in a, the context of a one over n expansion, we can further expand this action around the classical solution, and then uh, fluctuations around the classical solution. So the classical solution uh, for the finite temperature configuration was something like tangent, uh, this is in Euclidean space, tangent of tau 
uh, over beta, maybe a pi here. Um, and now, uh, small fluctuations, we just add an epsilon of tau. Um, and then we can expand uh, we can expand that action. And uh, so I'm going to come back here and simply say that uh, the expansion of this action contains uh, contains terms which are minus epsilon double prime squared minus epsilon prime whole squared. Okay. We mentioned that uh, last time. And then this is a quadratic action. We can also expand these pieces and then uh, find find the answer. And that will give us uh, the one over n. That will give us this term. Okay. This is not too complicated. I'm not going to do it explicitly, but uh, it can be done. Okay. So the important uh, an important feature of uh, this action is uh, that uh, it contains here these classical solutions, um, which uh, go like uh, a constant or like e to the uh, plus or minus i tau in Euclidean signature, which when you continue to Lorentzian signature goes like e to the e to the plus or minus t. Okay. And it is these terms that are related to the growth, to the chaos uh, uh, behavior in, in the chaos regime. So these terms are, um, we are we, if, if we are doing the Euclidean uh, functional integral, uh, we, I, we mentioned last time that we could expand this in Fourier series. And then we do the, the integral of the, over each Fourier mode. And we do not include in those integrals this, uh, these three Fourier modes. Okay. But nevertheless, uh, it is possible uh, that um, um, so when we um, consider a correlator, um, um, especially a long time uh, correlator, which is uh, involves long time separation. So we can think of, uh, for example, there is. A, we, we take the, the 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 first g one two. Let's say this is at one and two. We'll have some sources for the epsilon, and we can think of uh, this as sourcing some um, some classical solution for the epsilon that then propagates at later times and then is measured by uh, let's say points three and four. Okay. Um, now, if this source is some classical solution for the epsilon, this classical solution might contain or not these terms. But because uh, these are SL2 reparameterizations and 3 and 4 is a G which is SL2 invariant, we will not get anything that uh, grows in time with this, um, with this configuration. Right? Um, but uh, if we have another configuration where in Euclidean time the points are ordered in this way, um, we, we might get some more uh, non-trivial uh, contribution uh, that is associated to these zero modes. Let me try to explain how that happens more in Euclidean signature and how it's related to the chaos uh, discussion. So the, um, we, we've seen that in order to see the growth of the commutator, it was enough to understand the decrease of a, of a particular out of time order correlator. Right? So we need to compute out of time order correlators. So out of time order correlators are given by uh, uh, correlator, which in Lorentzian signature, so those were Euclidean signature contours, so now we are in Lorentzian signature. Um, so we want to insert an operator here, so this would be operator number one, this would be operator number two, and then we want the three and the four to be uh, in this way. So we have two at, let's say, time equal to zero, two at uh, time equal to t, but they are ordered in such a way that uh, we have to go backwards and forwards in time okay, to compute this. And then of course, we could join these two by uh, going some um, some displacement uh, beta here. We introduce the temperature here and uh, connect when we connect these two. So, in the functional integral, we're not supposed to integrate over all over the overall uh, SL2 R zero mode. But here, what can happen is that um, these two are uh, sourcing a relative SL2 R transformation between these two parts of the contour and the other two parts of the contour, right? So this and uh, the one that well, goes in temperature back to here, right? Um, so if uh, that happens, then there could be, uh, so these two 
shift these two contours by this SL2R transformation, so they create a solution which differs between here and there by an SL2R transformation, and it can lead to an exponential, uh, well, some exponential deviation for this deformation for these two points. Um, and then, um, yeah, I guess I'm not explaining this clearly enough. <laughs> Let me be a little more clear. Uh, so we're trying to approximate uh, the functional integral, okay? Um, so the we are going to think about it the following way. So we, we start with some state for f, okay? And then uh, we are going to, let's say, think of these two as a source for a fluctuation, right? So f first epsilon was zero. Now epsilon is not zero. Now in these regions, we'll uh, get some source. This is some, let's say, term in the right-hand side of the equations of motion. Uh, so we can think of uh, these couples uh, linearly to epsilon, and we can think of uh, so, so this is the usual type of Green's function calculation where we, um, here this will expand to linear order in epsilon, and so this will source, uh, this will be like a source in the right-hand side of the equations of motion for epsilon, and um, then uh, we can have here uh, an epsilon which uh, contains, it will be the classical solutions, and the classical solutions involve the, uh, there are four classical solutions to that equation. This uh, these are three associated with SL2R zero modes, and there is one that is linear in T that is not important for our discussion. Um, and so we source those solutions, uh, and there are two in particular. There is a particular one that grows exponentially in time. Okay. So it grows exponentially in time, and so the epsilon here grows exponentially in time, and it will display it wh when we get to uh, points three and four. What we are going to do is we are just going to evaluate this. Uh, this function on those uh, on the classical solution that we got by solving the equations with the source. Okay. Um, evaluating this means uh, taking the original uh, function and doing the transformation given by this f. Okay. So this f is a particular transformation that um, is uh, displacing uh, point three away from point four. Okay because we have an exponentially growing reparametrization of this part of the contour relative to that part. It's not an overall reparametrization, it's just a relative transformation of this part of the contour relative to that part of the contour, okay? And uh, for that reason then, uh, we'll get uh, that the original function is that function of four times when we evaluate it, so let's say these two times are zero and these two times are t, we'll get that uh, it will go like uh, e to the t, okay? where this t is the t in units of 2 pi beta, so this is when two pi, two, when beta is 2 pi, and if beta is not 2 pi, we have just this. Uh, okay, so that is uh, an explanation for why we get this exponentially growing piece, okay? And why the uh, Lyapunov, so this is the Lyapunov exponent lambda, right? So let me be a little more clear. So we have the four-point function uh, is equal to a product of two-point functions, times one, and then there are some uh, corrections, and the corrections um, go like one over n, and then they're enhanced by a little factor of beta j, and in addition, it grows in time with this factor. Okay? And this is a piece that we can get from the Schwarzian action. It contains other pieces which are not growing exponentially in time, other, other one over n pieces, um, and then there are further, of course, corrections. Okay? So this is uh, a derivation for why this model is giving us the maximal Lyapunov exponent, and it comes from the pattern of symmetry breaking. So the fact that we had this emergent uh, reparametrization symmetry, and the fact that it was slightly broken. Okay. Okay. Mm. Oh, yes. Yes. How to get this formula? Um, well. Um, you uh, you take this action, you approximate it this way. You take the correlator 1 over t12, right, to the 2 delta. You reparametrize it by this function, okay? You expand to linear order in epsilon, here and here, and you do this functional integral, okay? You will get that answer. I didn't explain why you get that answer, but what did I do? Well, th yeah, this was the, the okay, 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 yeah. 
f1 minus f2, let's say, and then we put this a particular f, we put it here, and then we'll have to reparameterize putting f1 prime, f2 prime, the 2 delta, right? So we're just, uh, we put this expression here with that particular f, right? Is that uh, clear? And then we expand this whole thing to linear order in epsilon. So it's just something relatively simple you get here. And then you do this functional integral, and uh, you get this functional integral in Euclidean time, and then you have to continue to Lorentzian signature, right? Uh, and when you continue to Lorentzian signature, um, you have to order the points in Euclidean time in some particular way, um, so as to, yeah, the order of the operators in Lorentzian signature depends on the order that they had in Euclidean signature, right? So if you got the, if you want to put them in this out of time order form, you have to order the points uh, essentially like this in Euclidean signature. First one, then three, and so on. And uh, so you do the functional integral, uh, and you get some answer, uh, and the answer goes in that way. Okay, so that's the mathematical, I explained the mathematical procedure. That's, uh, that's the mathematical calculation. Okay, it might seem mysterious that we get that answer at this point. And then I try to give an explanation for why we get this answer, okay? The explanation for why we got this answer is that um, um, we think of this calculation. This is a typical Green's function calculation that we can think of. You know, you perturb the classical, the classical solution, which was initially zero. You act with a little source, which is one of the points. And then you solve the equations of motion, and then you evaluate the second appearance of epsilon. So first appearance of epsilon is the one that appears here, right? It acts as a source for the equation of motion that you get from this action, right? It's a fourth order equation. So it, there will be these uh, four solutions for linear independent solutions. One of them is growing, okay? Then you evaluate the, the, the action, uh, the action you get here on this uh, solution, okay? On the, on, if you take the epsilon that appears here, there will be an epsilon evaluated at three and an epsilon evaluated at four. Maybe we, there will be some epsilon three prime, etc. And uh, so linear combination of these things. And you evaluate on that solution that is growing in time, okay? And that's why you get this growth in time, okay? Is that not? I, I will present a slightly different uh, version. It's a little more geometric when we talk about ADS2, which I think probably I should talk right now. Um, I think it will become a little more clear when I give a more geometric uh, picture of what the Schwarzian means in ADS2, and then it will become a little more clear. So uh, the point I want you to get here is uh, number one is that this uh, behavioral late times is uh, dominated by the Schwarzian action, and it follows from the pattern of symmetry breaking. And second, that the uh, particular exponent we get here is associated to the fact that uh, we had this SL2R0 modes, okay? Um, and because of the geometry of the group, with the geometry of SL2R, we got this uh, particular exponent. Yeah, perhaps I didn't uh, explain this uh, properly enough. It will become a little more clear in a second. Um, well, maybe. Well, I. You can do as an exercise that if you take this f, which is tangent, and do an SL to R transformation of f, right, with small, uh, which is close to the identity, um, and then you try to reproduce whatever you get by uh, changing this epsilon, right you'll find that the, the epsilon is associated to SL trans to our transformations are these two, so exercise. So that's an exercise, right? So let me exercise. Take F to A F plus B over C F plus D, right? When uh, B and C are very tiny and A and D are very close to one, right? So you expand this. Um, so this is, uh, this will give you and the original f plus some delta f, right? And then uh, you match this delta f with uh, a similar delta f that you get by taking this expression and changing epsilon, right? So this should be equal to somehow d of this f times d epsilon and then some change in epsilon. And you will see that uh, the delta f's that you get uh, correspond to epsilons that are of these three forms, one for each of these uh, terms that you can change here. Is that uh, clear where this came from? Yeah. So it came from the geometric action of SL2R. Mm. 
Okay. Uh, so now, good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, ADS2 gravity. Um, so first, uh, we're, we're going to try to put this in context. So um, in in general relativity, in any number of dimensions and so on, we can have black holes, right? Um, these black holes uh, sometimes can have charges, let's say angular momentum or, 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 or electric charge, for example. Let's say it has electric charge. Then um, you typically find that uh, the mass has to be bigger or equal than the charge in order to have a reasonable solution without naked singularities. This is in some units of measuring the charge. Um, then um, you find also that uh, when the mass goes to the charge, so you saturate this inequality, uh, in, in typically you find uh, that the geometry develops an ADS2 region. Um, the Hawking temperature uh, goes to zero. Okay? So, and the geometry roughly looks like this. So it, this might be a black hole in R4, for example. And then um, in this, uh, so here we had R, uh, let's say, 3,1. Then here, uh, this geometry here becomes ADS2 times S2. Okay? So it develops a long neck with a uh, geometry of uh, two dimensional anti-sitter space. And this two dimensional anti-sitter space has some kind of scaling symmetry uh, that corresponds to getting closer and closer to the horizon. Um, okay, so we get some scaling behavior when you go near uh, near extremality. Uh, it's a bit like the scaling behaviors you get in uh, in uh, condensed matter physics when you approach a second second order critical point. Um, okay, so now what we'd like to be interested in is to describe the physics uh, at extremality or very close to extremality. So the, the case m equal to q is called an extremal black hole, and m close to q is near extremal black hole. <coughs> So let's first uh, do a naive approach. So we say, well, we have ADS2. So what could be gravity in ADS2? Could be just simply an action, which is like this. So we have a two-dimensional action. So we integrate uh, d to x, square root of g times uh, r. And then we'll have some coefficient here. I'm going to call it uh, phi naught. And the coefficient comes from, for example, the area of the sphere. So if we come from four dimensions, we have uh, the four-dimensional curvature, we have the area of the sphere in Planck units, so we'll, uh, that, that will be fine now. Okay, so this is our first candidate action, and this candidate ac action has a nice feature, which is that if you consider uh, this in a, well, we, we don't go all the way to extremality, but we consider kind of finite temperature configuration where this uh, has a horizon, then the Euclidean black hole solution, uh, you can evaluate it uh, on this metric, and this action is topological invariant, so it gives us a topological invariant of the uh, two-dimensional metric of the R and T directions, which is like a cigar, and that's the same as the topological invariant for the disk. So it's some factor of 2 pi or 4 pi or something like that. And so that gives us uh, the entropy. So it gives us the, let me call it S0, which is the actual entropy, which is proportional to this uh, phi naught up to, um, well, there, is a, there are some numerical factors which in the end give the area over 40 Newton, okay? So that's good, but we'll also like to uh, describe some near extremal properties. So we'll also like to be able to describe, let's say, particles propagating here, and uh, maybe the, if we have Hawking radiation or not, and so on. So we want to understand some aspects of the dynamics of the system. And the problem is that this action, due to the fact that it's topological, does not give any gravitational, not any non-trivial gravitational dynamics. And furthermore, if we think that we have this action for gravity, right? So if we have this action plus, let's say, some action for matter, uh, which contains, well, the, it has this metric, and let's say the, the, a bunch of fields that propagate on this metric. So this, this is the na first order naive approximation. And if we only have this approximation, then when we calculate the equations of motion for the metric, this term is topological, doesn't contribute anything, and this term would set the stress tensor of matter, uh, so T matter mu nu, we would set it to zero. Right? So that would be the equations of motion for this metric. So that is too constraining, I mean, it's just setting that we cannot excite this space. 
Okay, so that's a feature. Now, this feature is, uh, in some sense, uh, reasonable to expect, because if we thought that this uh, system had a quantum mechanical dual that has exact SL to R exact scaling symmetry, then the density of states in that uh, dual, um, well, first of all, we expect it to be finite because the entropy is finite. Um, but the density of states that are uh, consistent with conformal symmetry could be either delta of E, or let's say 1 over E, just this is by dimensional analysis. And in this case, we shall only have zero energy states. Uh, and in this case, uh, we have something that diverges at low energies, which is where the scaling approximation should be better. So in both cases, uh, well, this case is uh, wrong because it gives an infinity, so it's bad. And this, this, in this situation, we, don't, we are not free to excite the system, which is what we would like to do. So we might consider gravi a gravity like this in ADS2, and might be good for counting the entropy or the number of states that's exactly zero energy, and it's been used for this purpose, but it cannot describe the, the feelings of an observer inside ADS2. It doesn't allow an observer inside ADS2. So the, um, the thing to do is to um, modify this action slightly uh, and say that we have, well, we had that term that we uh, we had that term we liked. We we liked some aspect of this term, which is that it reproduces the extremal entropy. Um, and then uh, we are going to add a new term that uh, has the form square root of g phi r plus 2. And then we also have that s matter of uh, g and chi. Now, this phi field, uh, you should think of it as keeping the leading order deformations away from the extremal limit. So in the extremal limit, the, the sphere has a particular size. Um, but when we are near extremal, the sphere starts uh, growing a little bit towards infinity. And this phi is somehow the value of the area of the sphere uh, minus the extremal value, which was phi 0. Okay? So the total area of the sphere is 5 plus phi 0. OK, so we are going to consider this action. This particular uh, term is called the Yakib Teitelbaum term. Uh, it was also considered by Armeri and Polchinski. And it's a kind of simple uh, theory of gravity. And in fact, uh, this is the most, uh, th this is the generic uh, situation around ADS2. So let's consider a sphere, so the, the, the following is true. So if we consider a spherically symmetric uh, uh, gravity theory in two dimensions, so we'll have some term, in general, we'll have terms that go like, uh, Let's say we have some function of some field, right, times r. So this is in two dimensions. This is true for any spherically symmetric reduction of gravity, what I'm going to say right now. Um, so we can have a term like this. We can have a term that goes like b times phi. And we can have some terms that go like c of phi times uh, gradient of phi squared. Right? So this is the generic uh, spherically symmetric reduction of gravity. So we, had some f we have some field that appears multiplying r, and that same field could appear with a, without r, and it could appear also with this gradient. So that's the generic situation. And we can do here, we have the freedom of two field redefinitions. One is that we can field redefine phi by an arbitrary function of phi. And the other is that we can multiply the two-dimensional metric by another function of phi. So we have two functions, uh, two functional degrees of freedom by field redefinition. So by field redefinitions, we can just define whatever appears here as phi. Okay, That's one of the field redefinitions. And then we're left with these two. Um, and then we can do another field redefinition of the metric that somehow get, gets rid of this term. Uh, so then uh, we have this. And let me call the one that appears here as u. It's conventionally called u. Um, so that's a generic situation for spherically symmetric reduction. Okay. Now, if you, want it, if you want the solution to be close to ADS2, then uh, this, phi has to be, this u has to be linear in phi, and the coefficient sets the radius of curvature. The other things you can do, you can take this u to be other things, and then they describe other spherically symmetric uh, reductions. I mean, you can have the spherically symmetric reduction of the Schwarzschild black hole, for example. That would correspond to some particular u of phi. Um, um, OK. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that this is completely universal for any near extremal black hole. Okay, that's the correct description for any near extremal black hole. Um, and now uh, we had this uh, issue when we calculate the equations of motion for the metric. And now, we'll, instead of having this, we'll have also some kind of stress tensor that we get from phi. So we take derivatives with respect to the metric. We have a kind of 
stress tensor for phi, so let me call it d phi nu nu, and this, um, this stress tensor for phi um, has a bunch of derivatives, so it has the form of, roughly speaking, second derivatives acting on phi, plus some other, other combination of second derivatives, and it basically sets the value of phi in terms of uh, the stress tensor of matter. Okay. Um, okay. And in particular, in the case that there is no matter, uh, so we get, uh, so if, if this is zero, then we get uh, some equations, which, uh, well, I'm not writing completely explicitly, plus some other term of order phi. I'm not writing all the coefficients correctly. Equal to zero, and there is a, a solution to this. Um, so, well, one solution is zero, but we're not interested in the solution that is exactly zero, because... Um, but if phi has some value at the horizon, then... Um, um, okay, before, yeah, before doing that, let me just point out something. Let's look at the equations of motion for this metric. So the equation of motion for phi sets r equal to 2 and gives us a metric which is exactly the ADS2 metric. So in Euclidean space, that would be a metric that goes like d rho square plus inch rho square d tau square. Tau is the Euclidean time. And then, uh, if we vary the metric, then we get uh, an equation like this, and whose solution is uh, phi equal to the value it has at the horizon times cosh of rho. And this is essentially the unique solution up to an overall constant here. So phi is not a dynamical field. Uh, there, this, uh, this action has, uh, in some sense, no dynamics. It's basically pure constraints in uh, two dimensions. And this uh, agrees with the fact that um, we don't have, I mean, we don't have gravitons in uh, two dimensions because uh, there are no transverse dimensions, right? Or you don't have spherically symmetric uh, gravity waves in higher dimensions. Very good. Okay, so that's, uh, that's well, this is a straightforward analysis. Now we'll do a slightly more sophisticated analysis. We are going to ask um, ourselves what, what are the asymptotic symmetries of ADS2, okay? Uh, And this makes some connection with, uh, with other things. We, we will resonate with some things. We. So asymptotic symmetries uh, are symmetries which preserve the asymptotic form of the metric, but uh, do not preserve the whole form of the metric, okay? only the asymptotic <coughs> form of the metric. So for example, the metric very far away goes like e to the 2 rho d tau square, right? plus, uh, well, d rho square. So the leading factor that is very big is this factor. Okay? And so if we so this has a following symmetry. So if we change tau to some function of tau, right? Um, and at the same time, we change uh, rho to um, rho minus uh, logarithm of f prime, right? So if we do this change, um, then we see that, uh, so here we will get an f prime, but after we do this shift, we cancel that f prime, and we get the same form of the metric, right? So the symptotic form of the metric essentially uh, remains uh, remains constant, and we can adjust this a little bit so as to keep the leading order term here also uh, invariant. Okay. Uh, so this is what's uh, called an asymptotic symmetry, and people have studied asymptotic symmetries a lot in flat space, in uh, in ADS, etc. In, and in this particular case, ADS2, we have this infinite dimensional group of asymptotic symmetries. Um, okay. Uh, so any situation that uh, has uh, the symmetry will will have this. Um, Say again. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, you can you can take this. Yeah, that's right. Um well, I mean you can you can view that infinite line as uh, uh as the limit of a yeah. Um Um, well, if, if you think of if you think of the infinite line, you allow these uh, transformations that are singular, that have some singularities. Like that transformation, for example, has singularity at some point. And so, if you want to deal with a space that is a uh, little ni more nicely defined, you would uh, take uh, functions which are um, so you would you would work in the picture here that we are working here right now, where tau is compact. 
and then the functions um, are periodic and have no singularities. Okay, so if you the, if you want to think so that that line is something that is useful. So you could work completely at the level of the circle. Uh, thinking about the line is, if you wish, an approximation that is uh, particularly useful. Uh, just, I, I, it has just a slightly simpler form for the sl 2 transformations and so on. Uh, and in addition is uh, some limit where you take the actual physical value of the size of the circle to infinity. Um, I'll, I'll discuss what the physical value of the size of the circle is in a second. So for, for the time being, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying anything about it. OK, so that's the asymptotic symmetry. And one, there is one, um, and we are changing the bulk metric. So one way of thinking about this um, is the following. So um, we have ADS2, OK? And it will be important for us that we'll put a boundary uh, at some, some location that we'll discuss later. And we fix the metric. Uh, along the boundary to be fixed. That's the fixed physical value of the size of the circle. That's a sort of part in response to that question. So this uh, fix, so the, the actual proper size of this metric fixes the temperature of the theory, okay? the actual physical temperature. So physical, the, what we would call physical time, or the time in the boundary theory and so on, is the actual proper time along this circle. Okay? Um, now, when we do one of these transformations, uh, we can uh, imagine that as, uh, so it's a kind of reparametrization, and um, it's equivalent to saying that we have uh, now here the boundary is another line with the same proper size that we had here, right? So there's an infinite number of uh, families, there's an infinite family of lines with uh, the same uh, proper size, okay? Um, and if the original action had been just uh, this first term, uh, sorry, before I say that, um, so acting with one of these transformations will transform one of these lines into one of these other lines. Um, now, the, the full geometry that we have in the interior um, is locally is the same in these two cases, but it's actually different because it's uh, the whole shape, shape that we cut out is different, right? So for example, if here we calculate the two-point function between two points that are differ by beta over two, we'll get something that is constant as we move these two points. While here we might get these two points, or we might get th these other two points that are closer, and then uh, we'll get something different for that two-point function. Okay? Yes. How is it? Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. So the the well. Um, yeah, if you, um, um, yeah, so, so when you think about the conformal frame, what you are imagining is that, uh, well, we have some proper size that is defined. Um, it's different in the following sense. I'm, I'm just fixing the proper metric along the boundary, right? Um, and then you could say, well, I changed my proper metric. So the, the, pr the point is that, um, Changing the time or changing the proper metric is the same, right? So in that sense, it is the same. So I could just say that the the u uh, so the metric is just constant. So this is uh, normally we just pick this to be the the proper metric along the line. Uh, changing the conformal factor would be here putting an arbitrary function of u. Right? Um, then that's equivalent to redefining this time by uh, you can absorb this in this proper in this factor. Um, I'm choosing this language of the, uh, I'm choosing uh, here, uh, so in this particular two-dimensional case, it's also related to, rep well, as, as we said, we can change the, the factor by doing a reparametrization. That's not something we can do in uh, higher dimensions. Um, and so it's convenient to think of this in terms of uh, the symmetry of uh, changing the, uh, the time on the boundary, yeah. the reparametrizing the ADS time. Um, OK, so um, th the point here is that when you do one of these reparametrizations, you, um, you um, locally is invisible. So if you are a local observer who lives here, you don't notice the difference. But if you have access to longer times, you really notice the difference. Okay. Um, and so 
Very good. So when we when we fill when we fill the space in with some metric like the ADS2 metric, uh, it uh, breaks uh, this uh, these asymptotic symmetries and they, it breaks the symmetries to just the SL2R subgroup. So we can still get this circle, and if this circle we displace it in SL, inside the the whole infinite disk by an SL2 R transformation, we'll still the circle will still have the same shape. So if you're inside the circle, you not do not notice any difference. Um, okay, so that, that's the same pattern of symmetry breaking that we had in the SYK discussion. So in the SYK discussion, we had a two-point function of the fermions, which was SL2 R invariant. That two-point function of the fermions is morally similar to uh, this ADS2 metric. Okay. I'm not saying that I'm giving you a precise map, but it's having the same effect in terms of uh, symmetry breaking. So on the level of just the boundary, we have the reparameterization symmetry. When we fill it in, we just break it. Okay, so uh, this might lead us to expect that also in this case, uh, this action might uh, reduce to the Schwarzian action because uh, we had the same uh, same features and indeed uh, indeed uh, you can we can look at that action and we can uh, analyze it a little more precisely so we have I'm going to rewrite it here the part of the action we are going to be interested in is this term and we have to remember to add here a term that uh, contains the extrinsic curvature in order to make the um, variations of the action uh, well defined to recover properly the equations of motion. So phi b is the boundary value of this uh, dilaton field and we are going to fix it and will be part of our boundary conditions will be to fix this uh, boundary value of the dilaton field. Okay. So we are fixing the boundary value of the metric uh, to have a given proper size, and also we'll fix the boundary value of the dilaton field. Okay. Now, uh, so this is the action, whose, uh, and now we do need to do the functional integral, and we can do first the functional integral over phi, and that sets uh, r equal to minus 2, right? It's like a delta function, and, uh, and, and then we, we just lost this term in the action, so after we do that, we uh, now have to integrate over, um, well, now this fixes the metric, and now the only degree of freedom that remains is where the boundary is, right? So it's similar to the pictures we were drawing over there. So after uh, integrating out phi, we integrate out g, let's say using the delta function condition, and all we have is some integral, uh, some action, which has the extrinsic curvature along the boundary, and this phi b, right? So this uh, will be the action for our system. And then we are supposed to integrate over all boundaries, right? So we see that we get uh, an action for the boundary trajectory, um, and it's an action which is uh, local in time along that uh, boundary trajectory. And if we generate the, uh, that uh, boundary trajectory by doing an SL2, by doing a general reparameterization, then uh, we can think of this. Uh, we can think of this action as um, an integral over some dfs uh, divided by the volume of SL2, um, and then some action, which is an action of a, on, a, of a, on f of f. So, um, and it has again the uh, um, some, let me call it phi tilde renormalized times. Uh, the integral again of the Schwarzian um, f of u u is the proper time along the boundary. Okay, it rescale proper time, rescale as uh, indicated over there in the last blackboard. Um, so we recover exactly the Schwarzian action. So this is we I, I told you that we expect to get it, but you can just follow the steps I mentioned here and find that you actually do get the Schwarzian action. Right? Um, I guess I'm not giving you the details, but it's uh, sort of a straight, some calculation where you um, you parameterize the shape of the trajectory in terms of um, <coughs> in terms of f, right? And then you get uh, you get this action. So um, th the point of uh, going through this is to uh, emphasize that uh, 
nearly this this we can call nearly ADS2 gravity or nearly ADS2 um, and uh, nearly ADS2 has the same pattern of symmetry breaking uh, as the SYK model so they share with the SYK model that uh, pattern and because they share that pattern there are many uh, many things that uh, are the same in the two models right uh, so for example the near extremal entropy is always proportional to the temperature that we mentioned was one result that uh, followed from follow from this action simple result and also if we calculate uh, correlation functions in uh, in this geometry so correlation function will be given by uh, inserting operators here and then uh, considering geodesics or considering waves that propagate let's say waves that propagate in ADS2 um, and so those waves uh, propagate on some fixed background uh, but then you have the fact that the trajectory of the boundary um, is subject to fluctuations which are the fluctuations of the action F and you can calculate uh, for example a four-point function that uh, is given by uh, you know waves that propagate between points one and two and three and four um, and there will be a contribution that uh, is, is particularly large of this uh, four-point function that will come from uh, integrating over f right and that calculation is exactly the same as the calculation I we started the lecture with right um, so we'll have to uh, we just calculate first the two-point function in um, so there is a two-point function we can calculate I'm going to call it G also so this is the two-point function of the fields in the fixed ADS2 background so this depends on some fields tau 1 and tau 2 and in principle also row 1 and row 2 uh, so this is the Green's function uh, in the ADS metric okay of course it has a simple behavior in row 1 and row 2 because we are somehow close to the boundary right given by the anomalous dimensions okay. it has some power law behavior in row 1 and row 2 um, e to the there are some factors of delta uh, rho 1 plus delta rho 2 that's the dependence on rho 1 and rho 2 and then we have some function uh, g hat uh, sometimes called the rho normalized one of tau 1 and tau 2 which is uh, a power law in this particular coordinates is a sign of uh, tau 1 minus tau 2 to the to delta and uh, then when we do a reparametrization uh, indicated here so we'll get the factors of f prime from shifting uh, the values of this row and uh, then here we insert uh, the reparametrization and that's the same formula that we were using before right for essentially the same reasons uh, and so we'll also recover the um, the scales computation that uh, also gives us the maximal exponent uh, and so on for for these reasons okay yeah so uh, in this action if we uh, just include the matter action and don't include the Jackson type form yes so uh, uh, will that break the reparameterization symmetry as well uh, uh, how, like if you just omit the second term and no just keep the no no this one th th this this one this one is exactly ADS2 symmetric and <laughs> will preserve the the asymptotic symmetry so the asymptotic symmetry is a property of your space time and if you put matter coupled uh, covariantly to that space time it will continue to respect those asymptotic symmetries so this this does not break it yeah. so the fact that it's breaking it is uh, basically we add this term and we fix the boundary condition of the uh, of the dilaton in this way and that's why it appears here so to be a little more precise just to make this more concrete so that we um, we have to rescale so in order to get this action we have to say that phi b is at this phi tilde renormalized this is stays constant and then we take epsilon to zero and that pushes this circle very close to the boundary region and this whole thing uh, this whole th this this whole thing goes to this finite uh, expression um, so well i mean th this is this is a standard more or less cal this is a more or less standard calculation uh, so this term when epsilon goes to zero this term diverges this term also diverges but the divergence is just proportional to the length we subtract that off and the thing that is finite is this quantity uh, which is dependent of on f the divergence is independent of f um, 
Um, okay. Uh, yes, good. So the difference between the two orders comes uh, comes um, when we integrate over f. So this 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 part here is uh, the same as independent of the order. This could be two different fields, right? So these two g's are identical, right? And um, it's uh, it's in the integral over the fluctuations of this boundary that we get the difference between the two orders. And let me let me give a little uh, a nice uh, physical picture for uh, for the calculation of the four point function again uh, that is uh, valid in. I mean, for gravity uh, in ADS2, so so it's a, this this picture I'm going to give right now is a picture for the gravitational dynamics of uh, the Yakit Teitelboim model. So the idea is that uh, so we're in Lorentzian signature, so ADS2 in Lorentzian signature looks like a strip. We can choose uh, various coordinates for this strip. Are, are you all familiar with this picture of ADS2, or should I? Who, who wants me to say more more words about ADS2? So the, this is the Penrose diagram of ADS2. Um, um, the, th those coordinates I had written here, if continued to Lorentzian signature, would cover just this exterior, this region here, this so-called Rindler wedge of ADS2. And it looks like a thermal state from this point of view. Um, and so if we continue the picture, that Euclidean space picture, to Lorentzian signature, so this slice would be a slice that cuts through the middle of that disk. And then the boundary here would follow a trajectory that hits the boundary of ADS at these two at the times here, right? And then we have a boundary on the other side. So the analytic, the, the continuation of that gives us a picture for the thermophile double, which contains two boundaries, okay? And so on. And so you will have two Schwarzian actions, one for this boundary and one for that boundary, okay? Now, um, and this particular trajectory of the boundary will be uh, a solution to the Schwarzian action. So it's given as a solution of the Schwarzian action. Now imagine that uh, we send in some matter. So we, um, I should have drawn this a little bigger. So let me draw it bigger here. So this is uh, the same picture, but I'm going to concentrate on this region. So we had the original trajectory of the, uh, of the boundary. Um, we are taking a scaling limit where this is very close to the boundary, so I'm exaggerating here the distances. Um, and um, let's say we send in some matter uh, into the interior. Now here, the interactions between the matter, so the matter is, uh, well, the, the matter that appears over there, and the interactions between the matter and this boundary particle um, are SL2 are invariant. So in particular, we can think of this as really uh, an actual particle, and this has a momentum conserving interaction. So the, the two momentum of this particle and so on are related to the SL2 charges of the system, of the system of these particles. And so we can think of this as a momentum conserving interaction, and in order to understand the dynamics, we see that when we, a particle goes in, uh, this trajectory gets a little kick, and it gets a kick outwards, and so the new trajectory will go more like that. Okay? So this is the boundary trajectory after uh, we send in some particles. So it's a description of the classical equations that uh, follow from this action, um, emphasizing the fact that uh, there is this underlying sl 2 symmetry, which is the symmetry of ADS2. Let, let me say first uh, this a little more clearly. Um, so as, as we notice here, uh, um, after integrating out phi, there is no bulk gravity term in the action, only a boundary term. So um, the, the physics is just the physics of fields and particles moving in exactly ADS2 with no gravity in the bulk, and a boundary uh, particle that somehow responds to, somehow moves and has its own dynamics. Dynamics given by that extrinsic curvature term. Turns out that that's the same as the dynamics of a particle in an electric field, but we don't need that. So we, we, what we need is that it is just some dynamics, right? That uh, is SL2 invariant. Um, so this is a bit like a randall syndrome model, where you have a bulk and a brain, right? This is the UV brain, and we have uh, gravity. 
and all effects of gravity are encoded in the motion of this brain. So, for example, I'm now discussing a, a particular effect where, which comes from when you, in, when, when you send in uh, some matter into a black hole. What do you expect? You expect that the mass of the black hole will increase and that uh, regions that were the horizon of the black hole somehow moves outwards in the sense that regions of the space-time that before you st send in the matter were visible now will not be visible anymore. Right? Um, and that uh, shows up here because you, this boundary mo the trajectory of the boundary particle moves out and now hits the boundary of ADS, um, um, it hits the boundary of ADS uh, sort of at an earlier boundary time here, and therefore the horizon is uh, it, it has moved outward. So this region that before was visible now is not visible. Okay. Um, so this is how this is an example of how this uh, dynamics of this particle encodes the gravitational dynamics of the system. Um, very good. So it's a very simple, it's a simple story. And then uh, let me go back to the computation of the out of time order. Uh, um, okay. Um, well, I'm not sure where to do that. So um, this, uh, so here you have the the, the difference, the proper, the distance between these two boundaries is growing exponentially. It doesn't seem in the in the plot, but uh, here, when you send something in, these two start uh, diverging and deviating in an exponential fashion from one another. Okay. Um, but this exponential growth in this particular setup is not something that you can uh, directly see. It's not seen in a simple observable. Like, for example, if you compute an additional two-point function here, so we have this two-point function here, and then there is another two-point function on this uh, on this trajectory, we'll get essentially uh, a similar answer that does not reflect exponential growth, okay? Because of the SL2 invariance of the calculation of these two-point functions. Um, so in order for to make this exponential growth visible, you have to consider this uh, out-of-time order correlator that allows you to have other copies of this contour, and then you can measure the distance between uh, these copies, okay? And so you can... Um, um, so for example, you have... You, um, you insert some, let's say you uh, have this originally some trajectory here, uh, you insert it, um, so which was going backwards and forwards in time, along, well, along let's say the same trajectory goes backwards and forwards in time, but now here you inserted some operator, so this is the operator you inserted at early times, let's say psi of zero, and uh, so now you'll follow a different trajectory, right? Um, and now uh, you um, you calculate uh, a, a two-point function. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. This was uh, one trajectory that was coming back uh, from the future. Now we insert some operator. When we go back to the future, it's at some other position. Okay? That, that's clear. And here we are going to insert the two other operators, right? The O, uh, let's say the Psi, well, these are, this is the insertion of one of the operators, and then we can insert the other two operators. And we see that now uh, these two insertion points are going to be exponentially distant. Okay. So we'll get that uh, exponential uh, decrease of the full correlator. Right? And then, well, then we have that this... Uh, so forwards in time, backwards in time, we have the insertion of the other operator, and then forwards in time, and they close. Right? And the whole thing has to close by itself to our symmetry. Um, so that's... Uh, that's the picture, and the exponential deviation is the exponential deviation that we saw here when we kick when we kick this boundary trajectory uh, by sending in a particle or acting with an operator. Um, okay, so I hope that picture is is uh, is, um, is clear, and in this way we can see also some other uh, fun effects like uh, the fact that um, um, that you can make. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not sure whether to mention this or not. But so you can make wormholes, worm, wormholes traversable um, by, uh, as noted by uh, Gao, Chaffers, and Wall. Uh, you, um, if you have uh, the thermal field double, um, so we have uh, originally this uh, situation. 
And then if here you introduce an interaction between these two uh, points, so on the, in, the, in the boundary system, you can think of this as two quantum systems in an entangled state. Um, yeah, I guess. Are you familiar with that, or should I explain that? Explain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good, so I think I'm going to be out of time. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, that's something a little more basic. Um, so let's uh, think about the trace of e to the minus beta h. So this is in the in some boundary theory, right? Um, we can think of this as evolution in Euclidean time, right, on a circle. Now imagine that uh, we take this evolution in Euclidean time and we cut. Uh, here and here, right? And we can now, from here on, move to Lorentzian signature. Okay. So that is something. That procedure is something that pre pre um, uh, prepares something called the thermophile double, which is a state that is uh, given by sum over all the energy levels of e to the minus beta um, e n over two, and then we have the state for one energy level on the right and the CPT conjugate uh, state on the left. Okay, So here, if we're moving forwards in time, that's why we have this. And here, we have essentially the same thing, but moving backwards in time, that's why we have this CPT conjugate. So anyway, so we have this uh, thermophile double. And then we can continue this to Lorentzian signature. Um, and well, that, that will give us some state. So this is an entangled state of two separate uh, systems. Each system has its own Hamiltonian. So there's a Hamiltonian for the, let me, so this is in Euclidean signature is this, and then we continue in Lorentzian signature. We have a Hamiltonian, which is the same Hamiltonian everywhere, but we should think of this as a right Hamiltonian and a left Hamiltonian. So the two Hamiltonians are identical, but they are acting on two copies of the system. Okay, um, okay so that's, uh, um, that's the boundary picture. Now, in the bulk, uh, so if the system has a gravity dual, uh, this uh, calculation typically has, uh, is described by a black hole, Euclidean black hole solution, which has the topology of a disk. And uh, then uh, this procedure of cutting here and going to Lorentzian signature will produce for us the uh, this, this thermophile, this um, uh, maximally extended uh, black hole. Uh, that has two, two exteriors. So this is the exterior, the right exterior, the left exterior. And these two exteriors share this common interior. Okay. So in the Schwarzschild case, this might have singularity here. In uh, these ADS situations, the singularity is more like that. But well, those are some small details. The important point is that uh, we have these two exteriors, uh, and the geometry in the interior is connected. And again, uh, we should think of this as dual to two systems uh, that are defined on these two boundaries. And um, well, there are things like we cannot send the signal. So if we want to send the signal from here to, to the right-hand side, we cannot because we send the signal. It goes into the interior, but it doesn't make it to this exterior region. I, I should emphasize that uh, so this in these Penrose diagrams and in all the Penrose diagrams I was drawing before, this distance uh, looks finite, but it's uh, really an infinite amount of proper time. So this, I, I didn't say that, but uh, I should have emphasized it. So this curve here has an infinite uh, proper length, and so an infinite amount of proper time. Okay. Um, um, and so on. So we, you can uh, well do various things with this. Um, now, from the point of view of quantum mechanics, no, no one forbids you from uh, coupling these two systems. So they are decoupled, but you can just say, well, let's just couple the two systems. Let's add an operator, let's say at some time, that uh, some operator that, so we now take the thermophile double, the thermo, thermophile double. Before we were evolving this with two separate unitary operators, you left and you right, right? That uh, commuted with each other. They correspond to these two operators. But now, before we do that, let's say we uh, act with an operator, e to the o left, o right. Okay? So an operator which is the product of two operators, one on the left, uh, one on the right. Um, and if you think of this as two physical systems living your, in your lab, let's say a bunch of spins here and a bunch of spins here, no one forbids you from coupling the two, uh, the two operators, uh, the two systems. Um, 
So, and that leads to an interesting effect. So, um, come back to this picture. So, initially we had the thermophile double that had these uh, two copies, um, and where the two boundaries were like that. And now we are uh, putting this operator. And it turns out that you can adjust these couplings so that the leading term, the leading effect, comes from the expectation value of the O left or right operator. And that expectation value depends on the location of this boundary. So they depend on this, uh, this boundary degrees of freedom. And uh, it, they give rise to, so if we had an action which contains this expectation value, uh, so the expectation values with all these other expectation values we are computing, the leading order is uh, computed by something that is the expectation value in the in, in the fixed ADS background, and then uh, we do a reparameterization given by these Fs of, this, um, of that expectation value. Um, and that corresponds to um, really looking at the, um, so, so that, that uh, has an alternative description by saying that uh, this uh, gives rise to a potential, so this expectation value is a potential between the two boundaries. And if you choose the sign of uh, this coupling constant right, this exponential, this po potential can be attractive, and if this potential is attractive, now um, the trajectories of these two boundaries will be kicked inwards, and they will look like that. Okay. And so now, uh, if you send in, uh, if you had sent in a particle here from the left that before was not managing to um, to get to the boundary, now can indeed uh, get to the boundary. So after we do this, so it makes uh, the wormhole traversable. And now it's not surprising you are sending information from one side to the other, given that you put an interaction. But the interesting thing is that the, the um, this information is not it's not obviously going through the operator, right? It's not that you are sending this particle and suddenly this particle comes here and it emerges here, and no, it's just it's going through this uh, wormhole, right? Um, and well, there are a few other things one could say about this, like this is related to teleportation and so on, but uh, I would not uh, emphasize that too much because I'm, well, I guess I kind of run out of time, so I, well, maybe I'll just uh, explain that a little bit. So, um, um, yeah, the, 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 the reason one uh, might be interested in understanding this uh, further is that um, so um, this, this signal here, so it's, um, it's going through the wormhole and reaching here with the same uh, somehow shape that you send it in, essentially. So if you send in uh, a bunch of fields that are, let's say, forming, uh, that are in some pattern, let's say a message, the message gets uh, exactly uh, Undeformed here, perhaps deformed by an SL trot transformation, but that's something relatively simple um, the, to the right hand side. Right? It's not that it has to squeeze to go through this operator and gets completely mangled. It uh, manages to go through uh, quite simply to the other side. And that fact uh, follows uh, essentially from, um, from the fact that this whole calculation is, uh, is, can be done by thinking about the conformal symmetry and this uh, reparameterization symmetry. So this calculation would have the same value, the same answer, uh, both in ADS2 and the, S in the SYK model. Right? In the SYK model, also, if you set up this uh, type of uh, interaction and this type of experiment, you would see the same feature, that if you, you do some modification here, it will be suddenly then correlated with something here on the, on the right-hand side. Um, 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 well, the, the system that, um, no, I mean, the, the, here we're, we're thinking of the previous evolution up to here, and then from here we have uh, the evolution um, given by the red curve. Right? Um, let me see, what, what do you have in mind? I'm not following, sorry. You, you come from here? Yes, yes, yes. 
Yeah, yeah. For that, you need to have uh, somehow two traversable wormholes and boost them in some ambient space. Um, and uh, well, I mean, the, the point here is that um, um, we, we are not joining this into some uh, asymptotically flat space. I mean, if, if we were to join this into some asymptotically flat space and so on, then this would violate the causality of that asymptotically flat space. I mean, in, in this space, this interaction that involves these two faraway points, if you only think about this space, this is a very causality violating interaction, right? It's uh, connecting. So you can send some particle here and it will immediately come out here. But you're only surprised about this if you thought that these two are completely disconnected. But these two, I don't know, could, could be actually at the same point in some ambient space, right? And then it's not a problem. So, and it's not a problem because you, yeah. Um, it's just simply that uh, we, um, th this is embedded in a full space-time in such a way that uh, these two are, are, are somehow in the same point in that time in space-time. Um, so this whole discussion of traversability of wormholes being bad and so on arises when the wormhole uh, exists in some ambient space, right? So you have some black hole here and some other black hole here and they're connected through the wormhole. And if this kind of wormholes were traversable, then you would violate the causality of this ambient space, right? Because it would take uh, shorter to go through the wormhole than going through this ambient space. So, uh, right. Um, okay. Um, well, let me, so I'm, I'm out of time, so, um, for the next, uh, well, let me, I should summarize. So the, um, what I tried to convey today was to, to emphasize that both DSYK and a, nearly ADS2 have the same pattern of uh, symmetries. Uh, they realize the conformal symmetry and this nearly scale invariance in the same way, okay? Um, and uh, however, we do not know what the exact dual of uh, SYK model is, okay? Um, it, um, a naive uh, proposal would be to say that we have uh, the dual of SYK uh, would be an action, well, the Jakib titled by Max, well, the, the action that we wrote over there, plus some matter action here which involves n fermion fields. So, so one field per uh, boundary fermion. Um, now, um, if you assume that, uh, but th that description has some, well, first of all, we don't know whether it's correct or not. So at the level of the two-point function, it might be correct, but uh, at uh, some other levels, it seems to have some problems. Uh, it has some problems when we try to calculate the, the extremal entropy. It has some, uh, some problems when, um, yeah, when we think about the four-point function and its uh, high energy behavior. Uh, and it's, uh, well, some parts of the four-point function that I haven't discussed. Um, so it's not clear, and I think uh, hopefully it will be more clear what exactly the dual is. But um, another feature that uh, shows, well, th there's one feature about uh, about this Lyapunov exponent that uh, I have not uh, emphasized too much, is the fact that um, the Lyapunov exponent uh, um, goes so lambda is 2 pi over beta. And then there are corrections that go like 1 over beta j. In the, this, is, this is the SYK answer. And uh, this uh, really look like uh, stringy corrections. Uh, and so that's, that is suggests that the, um, the, the model, well, we, we can reproduce those corrections. Well, first of all, in any theory of uh, fields, just standard fields, standard field theory coupled to gravity, uh, we cannot have a correction of this form. Okay. <coughs> in order to get the correction of this form, one way we can get it using a gravitational-like theory is to have uh, stringy corrections, some corrections due to string theory. Um, and those corrections uh, for a general black hole, let's say a Schwarzschild black hole, they go like 2 pi over beta times uh, 1 minus uh, alpha prime over the size of the black hole squared. 
the radius of the black hole. In ADS2, these type of corrections are further suppressed by uh, some factor which has to do with the ratio of the extremal entropy and the near extremal entropy. Um, and this factor is, uh, in this case of SYK, is 1 over beta j. So that suggests that uh, in order to match these two formulas, this uh, factor should be roughly of order 1. So uh, that's uh, an argument. And th th this, is, this is a big argument because this formula only makes sense, or was only calculated when alpha prime over r square is very small. Um, um, but so that suggests some by string it means something where the bulk theory is non local in some more fundamental way than just the uh, uh, theory of this form. Um, but well, hopefully it will be understood what, what the, the dual is. I, l let me mention one other thing that I didn't emphasize before that uh, I think it's interesting is the, the, this fact that um, in all the examples of gauge gravity duality that we were th usually thinking in string theory are based on very symmetric uh, theories, supersymmetric and very special theories. In SYK, we have the opposite, so it's like the generic uh, generic couplings. Of course, it's special because there are couplings of only four fermions, but um, it's special in that sense, but it, that's the, that four fermion coupling is the generic coupling if you, if you impose time reversal symmetry. So there's a symmetry that would make this the generic uh, behavior. Um, and so we have also this feature of random couplings, which uh, we would like to understand more what the role of uh, perhaps random couplings is in, in gravity in general. Uh, um, so the indications are that uh, this is perhaps not a, a back. The dual would not be a simple field theory coupled to gravity. It will be more complicated. Um, uh, it will be perhaps some theory of uh, maybe induced gravity, where you have uh, the n fermions and the dynamics of the fermions on that background induces some action for the metric, and this action could be somewhat complicated. Um, but well, I, I say complicated, but maybe it's simple. So maybe you guys uh, will. Complicated only means people haven't found the answer yet. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and and an issue that uh, and that there are many many questions that uh, that one would like to understand in this, perhaps using this SYK example, and perhaps the. So all, all, most of the issues that I've discussed are issues that involve either almost classical gravity or semi-classical gravity, including gravitational corrections, but they don't involve quantum gravity in the very quantum regime where you are considering very um, many one over n corrections and so on. Um, and at very low temperatures, you might think that the uh, computation of the um, of these models are, are dominated by the Schwarzian action, and indeed there are some limits of the model where this uh, looks like it is the case. And in that case, you can do the quantum mechanics of the Schwarzian action completely, and you get some partition function. I, I mentioned this before. This was done by um, full references are in uh, um, so this this calculation is exact in the in the Schwarzian action, so it comes from doing the Schwarzian path integral. And there's a coefficient that is undetermined, and we know that it should be related to the ground state entropy. Um, and so this exact, this result, if you wish, is exact to uh, probably all orders in the 1 over n expansion. So suddenly it's exact in the Schwarzian theory, but probably the Schwarzian approximation fails for some reason. And it would be nice to uh, understand what, what, how to get the correct answer. This answer we know it's not correct when beta j goes to infinity. So when beta j goes to infinity, this partition function goes to zero, right? That's uh, some power. Um, but the correct uh, partition function of a system with a finite number of degrees of freedom should behave like, uh, you know, one plus perhaps some correction to the next level, right? And well, in front of this one, there might be a term that goes like e to the beta, right? Like the ground state energy. Um, but uh, certainly the coefficient of the exponential should be one, not something that is going to zero. Um, so we know this answer is wrong for extremely long beta j's. Uh, certainly for exponentially long beta j's where we start seeing the discreteness of the spectrum is wrong. And the question is how do we recover that discreteness of the spectrum? Because uh, recovering this discreteness of the spectrum from the gravity picture is uh, important for trying to understand what restores unitarity in gravity computation. So all the computations that I've discussed uh, so far are, uh, you know, information is lost. And 
even in this one, in some sense, information is lost because uh, you go to very long times and you get the wrong, the wrong answer. And so one activity people have been trying to explore this in various ways is to try to understand uh, how to get those uh, non-perturbative effects. And uh, so they, they should be here. We see that in this calculation and in many others, uh, we expect that information or unitarity is restored by non-perturbative effects, and we we'll like to understand them better. Thank you. Well, I, I, th there is at least one person in the audience that uh, there is one person in the audience. Can you raise your hand for Kenta? Yeah. Oh, it's next to you, so maybe he was telling you <laughs> to ask this question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who has written a paper saying that uh, we can uh, get some features of the spectrum of uh, some features that I have not discussed, in particular uh, the spectrum. So the the model has. Uh, so when you consider an operator. Um, when you consider this uh, two-point function and you do the operator product expansion, you find here a bunch of operators, O n, that have some anomalous dimensions, delta n, which are not the sum of the anomalous dimensions of these two. They have some non-trivial, uh, there is a non-trivial spectrum here of anomalous dimensions. And um, it's been suggested that perhaps you could get those by, uh, by considering a model which has ADS2, and then a circle with some, uh, which is not translation invariant on the circle, but has some kind of delta function interaction potential. And there, there is a, a relatively simple uh, setup of a circle, or maybe it's a C2 quotient of the circle, with a delta function potential that reproduces exactly the, 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 the spectrum of dimension. So in other words, when you do kaluza klein reduction here, you get a bunch of masses, mn squared, so that when you replace uh, the usual formula for the dimensions in terms of the masses, in ADS-CFT, you get uh, those dimensions. Okay. Um, now, um, there are some details of the proposal that uh, do not, well, at this level it works very nicely. Um, there are uh, some other details that don't quite match, but uh, maybe they might be made to match in some way in the future, or. And this works for the particular case of q equal to 4. Uh, somebody was telling me that they found a way also to make it work for the other values of q. Um, yeah, so this is some indication that perhaps the, But any, any theory like this uh, would not give us the correction to the Lyapunov exponent. So any theory that comes from kaluza klein reduction, that is gravity, maybe with, even with these complications, will not give us the correction to the Lyapunov exponent that we, we know we have. I, I didn't mention that. Uh, this correction um, can be computed. So there is some number here. It can be computed and was computed. So uh, we computed in the paper with Stanford uh, and myself. So um, uh, anyway, so it's there. And uh, it, I think it, I view it as a, an indication that is uh, somewhat stringy, the background that we need to, to get as YK. Uh, yep. So is there any hope that this might do something about